This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good afternoon. My name is William Self, and welcome to Think Tech. I'm excited this morning for two reasons. The content of the show and my remarkable guest. Justice for All is a book written by actually sacred writings, if I can be so bold, by a man named Lloyd A. Barbie. He's an attorney. He was a Renaissance man. He was a man with gifts and talents that preceded us, and he was doing things 50 years ago that are now just being talked about today. Uh, I have his youngest son, Rustin Barbie, and his daughter, Daphne Barbie Wooten, both of whom are attorneys. Uh, I want to preface my remark before I engage them in the show and say this. Uh, in the African-American community, there's a shortfall. Uh, most young African-American men have daddy problems, daddy issues, for a variety of reasons. Some is neglect, some is a lack of attention, some is a, a lack of presence. But one thing is certain, that role model, the father, is probably the most important relationship that we enjoy. And sometimes, we get lucky. And I think in this instance, Lloyd Barbie got lucky. Speaking of models, Lloyd Barbie was an attorney. His son is an attorney. His daughter is an attorney. His daughter's husband is an attorney. That's remarkable. Good morning, folks. Good morning. Good morning, Bill. Thanks for being on the show. If Dad were around today, how would he interface what's going on in Hawaii and what's happening in America currently? Be a leader, Russ. Okay, I'll, I'll start off. Um, my father uh, uh, had a, uh, a small connection to Hawaii. I know when uh, Patsy Mink was elected to uh, represent uh, Hawaii in Washington, he was a great admirer of hers. Okay. Um, she championed uh, women's rights, she championed civil rights, uh, and there was that connection uh, there uh, with Hawaii uh, earlier. Um, I believe that he would be very supportive of Native Hawaiian uh, rights and their movement going on now. Um, he, um, and Daphne knows some of the players in that movement uh, much better than I. Um, they, I know uh, uh, one person, um, Alnani K. Trask, went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison and uh, she uh, knew of my father and was an admirer of his, uh, watching his struggles in the state of Wisconsin. She, of course, returned to Hawaii and was a, a champion of, uh, of civil rights for Native Hawaiians okay. here in Hawaii. Let's dare to be real for about 30 seconds and tell me about your father's struggles, Daphne, specifically. Was it civil rights, women's rights? It was all rights, which is the title of the, the book, book, Justice for All. Um, my father was born in Memphis, Tennessee, segregated south, and um, he went to the North, Madison, Wisconsin, to law school, the segregated North. Yes. <laughs> and in fact, the statistics show that now Wisconsin is one of the most segregated states yes. in the United States, and that's North, not Mississippi, where our family understand. originated. So um, he came from a very um, uh, segregated society, a very prejudiced society, separate was not equal, and at a young age, he was the um, president of the youth NAACP. Um, he um, decided he was going to do something about it, and one of the ways he did it is become an attorney and to do civil rights law. I understand. Let's educate our audience right quick. What does the NAACP do? Do they, in fact, redress grievances on behalf of those disenfranchised or otherwise outside the system to address that grievance? Well, the NAACP, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, started in the early 1920s. and. Um, if you've read or know about Thurgood Marshall, he was uh, one of the lead attorneys that sued with the help of the NAACP to stop segregation in education, Brown versus Board of Education. The NAACP has been um, in the forefront of advocating for civil rights for people of all colors and for minorities. And presently, I think it has morphed a little bit. Um, but now they're- um, In what direction, Daphne? You mentioned morphed. What? Well, um, specifically what? Yeah. Right now, I think the NAACP is more focused on um, 
people who are disenfranchised, people who are discriminated against, and not just African Americans. Of course. Um, so they would file amicus briefs, for example, against the um, recent anti-immigration um, orders of, uh, that have come down from, from 45, yes. <laughs> the, um, yeah, the administration, um, and also find, uh, uh, supports other groups like the American Civil Liberty Union, ACLU. Um, in the past, I think they were more solo and um, uh, more focused on the treatment of um, African Americans, but now they have um, branched out. Okay. So it seems like to me, if we can if we can put our differences aside, we become a real force in the culture in terms of change. Absolutely. Remember what Nelson Mandela said: "If your Tell hand that. is like this, if your hand is like this, you know, you're individual, and it's not as strong. But if you come together, that's yes. a fist, and that's very powerful. Yes. And so I think you see that happening now. Although I still get a bit of people saying, "Well, we want to do." They want to go different directions by themselves. Sure. Um, not all women have supported African Americans. And not all African Americans have supported gays. And but we need to realize that we have the same common enemy, which is actually um, I think it's more at least nowadays money, um, yes. the rich and the powerful. And you look to see who they are, and very few of them are women. Very few of them are minorities. I agree. Um, and so one has to really take a look at what's going on in Hawaii, specifically the homelessness. Yes. You know, it's, it's, there's a big divide um, economy-wise. Yes. And you have the super rich who come from the mainland or from China or from wherever buying these condos for millions of dollars, sure. whereas you have someone who's lived here all his or her life. and. They, they can't get, afford to get into the game. They can't even afford a, the bench at the, at the bus stop. Yes, this is true. <laughs> That's why, I, in, in justice for all, it's a, it's a moral imperative. And when I say moral, I, I, I mean to imply that it's, as the brothers would say, it's righteous. Imperative is that it's crucial. Uh, Rustam, your father was a, a forward thinking. As a matter of fact, he was fighting for gay and lesbian rights in 1967 when the concept couldn't be sold. Even the legendary Martin Luther King took a step backward in terms of stepping out for gay rights, and your father introduced legislation to reduce discrimination against gays, uh, gays and, and lesbians. Uh, give me some more examples of your father's forward thinking. Okay. Um, he uh, was a proponent of um, decriminalizing victimless crimes. So he... Uh, Give me an example of that, Russ. He wanted to... Uh, What's a victimless crime? Uh, drug crimes. Okay. Uh, so if a person wants to choose to imbibe in uh, some sort of stimulant or narcotic, he felt that that was their personal decision the state should step aside. Um, he uh, proposed legislation to legalize and decriminalize marijuana use. Uh, and That's other, really progressive. My God, 50 years other, ago. And other drug yes. use. He uh, proposed legislation to... Uh, decriminalize gambling, he proposed legislation to uh, decriminalize prostitution. All of these he viewed as a personal individual choices that the state and government should have no business uh, being a part of. He uh, proposed legislation to outlaw sex crimes such as sodomy and things like that. Uh, and sodomy, of course, is a legal definition. It doesn't uh, necessarily mean what uh, people popularly yes. uh, think it does. It, it means include, going against nature, I, I would presume, or something like that. Oral sex or any uh, yes. thing that is a, a sexual uh, relation with another person uh, that uh, is consensual would be called sodomy back in those days. I'd like to, Bill, if I could just sure. read a quote from the book. Please do. Okay. Um, Let me one, get one up where they can see it. One of my dad's uh, quotes that I found uh, very compelling and timely today. Uh, freedom and democracy is not achieved just once. It must be won time and time again. Those, do, those who do not recognize this will soon find they are no longer free. And that's from 1972, and that's in the book that Daphne Excellent. edited. You know, I've been, I can't put the book down. I don't want to sound like, you're, like your best audience, but it's one heck of a read. Uh, what I find surprising about the book is that your dad was so frank in his discourse and he was so fearless in his approach. And when I look at his picture, I can see his intelligence jump off of him. But there was also a cool reserve about the man. I could see that he was dispassionate in many ways, along with that passion. Um, what was it like for you, Daphne, growing up as the daughter of Lloyd, Barbie? Well, he was...
was a very good father, I have to say. Um, he took us children to his demonstrations. We marched across the bridge for fair housing. We marched for the integration of schools. He didn't hide things from us. Um, we all had to work in his law office and answer the phone, yes. <laughs> type for him, yes. um, meet with his clients. Um, and uh, so he included us in many of his um, events, civil mm -hmm. rights events, so that we would catch the bug. And obviously, since I'm an attorney and my brother's an attorney, we caught that bug. Yes, you did. Um, Very well, by the way. Yeah. And so he did influence me quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, he was an excellent father, in my opinion. He even made, made us omelets on Sundays. Oh, nice. But then he, um, he also took us to the arts to have greater appreciation of the arts. Mm -hmm. He was a great father. We yes. met a lot of his clients. We went to a lot of his speeches. Um, and he taught us, I think, one of the most important things I learned from him is never give up, keep going forward. And it doesn't matter what people say about you or think about you. You just do the right thing. Yes. When we talk about imperatives, there's a, when we talk about money, life in America presents all of us with an economic imperative. And that's almost a strategy put in place against many minorities. They can't seem to escape the poorhouse. Rustin, uh, how would your father attack this economic imperative today? Very good question. I think he would be more aligned with folks like uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren who are um, advocating for uh, uh, trying to um, uh, equal the playing field as much as possible by uh, proportionate uh, taxation. Uh, my dad, uh, very early on in the 60s, um, uh, proposed legislation to tax churches. Um, That's interesting. And uh, that would cause an uproar. Starting at the Vatican, yes. It did. <laughs> so he felt that the churches are engaging in political activity and had no uh, reason, no no uh, no um, sensible reason, not to be taxed for their activities. So, yes. Uh, but uh, he was uh, always had a saying that he was for the have-nots. Yes. And the have-nots would be those uh, ninety-eight percent and yes. not the two percent. Uh, of people that uh, have the majority and there is a disparity. of the resources in, in this country. And there is a disparity when you see a, a priest in his $200 shoes and his $500 robe and his crucifix and uh, Hispanic and black children giving their nickels to the offering plate. When you would think that would be disseminated among those needed most, you would presume that those who uh, are in need of help would get the help first. It doesn't appear to be the paradigm of the model. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then nowadays you have uh, uh, issues like uh, gerrymandering where... Uh, Break that down for us. What is gerrymandering? Gerrymandering is when the party in power, the political party in power, uh, will uh, change the uh, district boundaries to ensure either that they have uh, more of their party members represented or they will uh, and, and dilute the, the minority vote. Uh, or they will a, uh, pack that, yes. the minority vote That's a into, into one uh, distinct uh, uh, region so sure. that uh, they just get that uh, one seat as opposed to uh, uh, possibly winning three, three seats in a state house. I understand. So uh, the gerrymandering uh, that's been going on for the past 12 years is a specific strategy yes. employed by the GOP on the mainland. He uh, would be... Uh, um, you know, uh, opposing that uh, and, and in the courts, fighting that, as the NAACP uh, has done recently in other uh, interesting groups. I mean, the dilution of, of the vote in the mainland is just incredible. You know, we're coming onto a break. I want to make a point very, very quickly. Uh, that's why we must study the spider, because the spider, he, as you well know, she's nodding her head. Mm -hmm. As you well know, they they defeat by strategy, mm -hmm. not by confrontation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening, in, I think, in the political arena. It's their strategy that defeats. Yes. Anansi, they call it Anansi, the spider. Uh, the African, I, I like Ghanaian, that. Akan, and yes. Jamaican. The uh, Anansi stories. You don't know nothing about Jamaica. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> now, I know about Anansi. <laughs> Thank you. As a matter of fact, I read in the book, Russ, where you told your father, you urged your father to buy land in Jamaica. If I'm not mistaken. He was, my dad was uh, in uh, most of his uh, uh, professional career, a work, what we'd call a workaholic. A workaholic. He would leave before six in the morning. He would come home after 11 at night. He would read for two or three hours before he went to bed. And he promised me that he would take me uh, on a vacation once I graduated undergraduate school. So I said, I'll go on vacation on one condition, that you come with me. 
So we went off to uh, Jamaica. We went to Negril, Jamaica, which is travel agent. Back in those days, you had travel agents make the arrangements. I was very shocked that he would go to Negril, Jamaica with me. He fell in love with it. He came back from Jamaica, uh, and he uh, took Daphne down there for the next trip. And within three months, and this is a workaholic now, yes. he fell in love with the culture and the people of Jamaica, and then uh, made a third trip and bought a beautiful uh, house in Jamaica which he uh, loves and we still have today. Which you still have. <laughs> yeah, and oh, one nice. other thing. One yes. other thing about um, Jamaica is um, he, uh, uh, when he when he came there, he said he wanted to spend his money in a, a predominantly black country. Ah. So he's tired of America racism. Yes. So yes. that's why. I get that. I get that. Uh, this is kind of a sample of Asia living in Hawaii. And I can't imagine the Japanese-American families buying Ford. They buy Honda. They get the concept. Uh -huh. uh, I see this uh, this interweave of ethnicity here in Hawaii and how it works, uh, how they support one another. Mm -hmm. uh, Chinatown is Chinatown. It's uh, an excellent model or paradigm for for us to forget our differences. And more recently, Vietnam Town. Thank you. <laughs> Fascinating what's mm -hmm. been done when they put those differences aside. And as you express, move in one direction as a force. Mm -hmm. That's what I like about the bear. The bear's resolve is apparent. Mm -hmm. The bear's committed. Mm -hmm. We're going to come up on a break. If you'll give us a few minutes to uh, introduce these uh, commercial messages, we'll get right back to you folks. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Greetings, it's me, Angus McTech, the longtime host and star of Hibachi Talk. Think Tech is important to our community because we bring all kinds of cool ideas and I bring gadgets to the, to the show, so you gotta watch it for sure. But for the first time, Think Tech Hawaii is participating in an online web-based fundraising campaign to raise $40,000. Give thanks to Think Tech. We'll run only during the month of November and you can help. Please donate what you can that Think Tech in Hawaii can continue to be public awareness and promote civic engagement through free programming like mine, and I'm in charge. I've already made my donation, and it's really hard to get this Scotsman to make a donation, but I already did. Please send in your tax-deductible contribution by going to this website, thanksforthinktech.cosbox.com. Say that three times fast. Closing. On behalf of the community enriched by Think Tech, Hawaii's 30 plus weekly shows, thank you, and we're mahalo for watching Think Peck and your gen generosity. Let your wing gang free wherever you be. Hello, ha! Hi, this is William Self. I'm here with Rustin Barbie and Daphne Barbie. Wooten, I stand corrected. This is injustice for all. It is a moral imperative. And I wanted to uh, breach this idea about realness and talk about the need to not only introduce people to what's coming ahead of us, but what's happened in back of us. I'd like to direct this at you, Rustin, uh, in a very real way. Give us the strategy put in place against Hawaiian and Native people to take power in their own land. Well, I, I, I think it's uh, pretty well uh, demonstrated what happened in Hawaii is a classic uh, colonial uh, techniques to uh, subjugate uh, people. Um, you bring in uh, the missionaries first uh, to uh, pacify and convert the population to Christianity, uh, make them docile and uh, worship Jesus and a, a, a white master, and then um, follow that with uh, economics by uh, disenfranchising them from their land taking their land through uh, various strategies, including marriage and uh, other means. Um, uh, so effectively uh, taking their economy and their culture, denying them the right to speak their own language and to do their hula. And then uh, finally, uh, you bring in the military to enforce all that on top. And they, what you see is the result of a disenfranchisement of a people um, you know, it, is it is it is it safe to say they they don't know who they are? If that's not too bold of a statement, once you take away the language, tradition, culture, you intermarry, 
uh, it, the lines become blurred. That's right, and then uh, you start some, to serve two masters. And sometimes the uh, subjugated uh, buy into this. And, subjugated and means to conquer. Is that that's break correct. it down for the brothers out there who are listening to listen? <laughs> sometimes uh, the the people that uh, have are the victims of this strategy buy into it and identify more with the victimizers yes. than their own people. And why is that? What? How does that psychology work? Well, I'll let my philosophy and psychology ah, sister explain all means, that to you. All well, means. as Bob Marley says, brainwash education. And that's what happens, is um, you get brainwashed. Yes. The propaganda of the media, propaganda yes. in the newspapers, yes. propaganda in the churches, yes. um, and in the schools. And they teach you things such as that you don't need to learn um, African American history, you don't need to learn Hawaiian history, Native American history. Christopher Columbus discovered America. What a big lie. Yes. What a big lie. And, and it completely obliterates the culture that was here before yes. he got lost and it changed that to, whole narrative. Yes, came yes. to the United States. Um, people did not, there's all kinds of horrible philosophers who are still read today who say that black people built nothing and they have nothing to <laughs> offer culturally. Well, you look at African history, human beings came from, from Africa yes. and people should be proud of being African. People should um, look at Africa and see who built the Great Pyramids. It wasn't slaves, it was Africans who built that. Um, Africans in Sudan, not just in, in um, Egypt. and. Uh, you know, I, I remember going to Egypt with my husband, and there was a school teacher from the South, Georgia, and she was on board, and we were looking all, at all the pyramids and looking at all of the um, majestic um, uh, monuments in Egypt, and finally she turned around, she couldn't take it anymore, and she says, so are the Egyptians Negroes? Uh, you know, you know. What's and, a Negro? Yeah, and the tour guide said, well, they're Egyptians, but yes, we're black. And yes. it's like, what? Yes. And you know, if you look at pictures that are shown in the majority of the schools in America, you won't see that, you won't make that connection. No, but if you, you actually go to the source, you will see that connection, you will know that connection. I think and you're you being will... misdirected. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's and part so of the strategy. It's propaganda. Yes. You know, I was talking to a, a Hawaiian woman. My journey started on Kauai almost 30 years ago, and she was explaining to me that there are 27 different forms of rain in Hawaii. Well, the spectrum of blackness, there must be at least 30 forms of blackness, mm -hmm. that thread. And speaking of Africa, uh, the original people, speaking of Jesus Christ in the Bible and that lineage, the Torah began in Africa. All the applied sciences from the fulcrum to the pulley to the wheel to the lever, Africa, the fast drying process, Africa, how to grow all the, the world's agriculture, rotating crops, Africa. The history is, as a matter of fact, uh, I studied martial arts for about 25 years, and my first class was in Korean. It was taught in Korean, and then the gentleman said, the master said that we are all a little Chinese, because what is shared with the world from the Chinese. And then he said, what is older than Chinese is the African, and we are also all a little African. Russ, I want to uh, try to keep it real here, if I can. Uh, there was a landmark case that your father won. Uh, it, it could rival Plessy versus Ferguson. Uh, I think it was called um, Armstrong and... Uh, versus Board of Education. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. It put his name on the back, it immortalized, uh, put his name on the map, it immortalized your father, it confirmed his work. Yep, Amos, Amos versus the Board of Education. He worked you, on the case for... Uh, I believe uh, uh, sixteen years. Um, sixteen years. Yeah, Lord. He, he organized. Uh, well, he he knows right away. As Daphne said in the uh, earlier part of the show, Milwaukee is one of the most segregated cities in the United States. That's hard to fathom. Yeah, it's more segregated than Chicago, believe it or not. Yes. Uh, you can pick streets and and uh, tell by somebody's neighborhood what ethnicity they are. Yes. Uh, so what happened was there was the uh, uh, day. Um, uh, de facto um, segregation of the schools, meaning that you had uh, schools that were 100% uh, uh, of one either uh, uh, Caucasian or, or uh, African American. And they also had in place a busing system that would uh, do intact busing, which meant that uh, when intact busing. intact busing would be, uh, generally speaking, taking black kids out of a black neighborhood school and uh, that was under repair and moving them to a white neighborhood school, keeping them in a segregated classroom, according to the people that came over on the bus, segregated uh, cafeteria times, 
Uh, it was just in your face, blatant racial yes. discrimination in public schools where public taxpayers are paying for that school. I'm gonna, and he, like, he was uh, just um, uh, very upset with this situation yes. because, as again Daphne mentioned, it was not separate but equal. Yes. It was separate, unequal, and pure bigotry. And your father introduced the legislation that eventually brought this system down and integrated the school he system a, in the state a, he, of Wisconsin. He bought a federal lawsuit. Thank Initially you. was backed by the NAACP, he but they felt that they had a very slim chance of winning in Milwaukee, so they dedicated their resources to a different part of the country and that legal team. So my dad ended up doing it by himself with an expert witness uh, and uh, a team of volunteer lawyers, uh, not affiliated with the NAACP, yes. Uh, to carry uh, this um, lawsuit forward in the federal district court in uh, the Eastern District of Wisconsin. And uh, went through many appeals in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, and he prevailed, and um, that, was, that was David versus Goliath. <laughs> That's true. Kudos, and uh, we're coming up on um, the end of the show, and when you're having fun, boy, time goes so quickly. But I'd like to be as frank as I can be on the ensuing 30 or 40 seconds. What are they afraid of? What are they afraid of, Daphne? Well, the power. What are they afraid of? They want to keep power. Remember, are they afraid Douglas, of me? Frederick Douglass said power <laughs> concedes nothing without a struggle. Thank you. Okay, so they want to keep the power. The they want to keep quo. the money. They keep want to the rule the world. Yes, they do. And they don't want anybody who doesn't look like them, talk like them, speak like them, involved. Okay, so they're self-absorbed. Yeah. Insecure, correct? And I mean, Russ, same question very quickly. What are they afraid of? Um, I would ditto those comments right there. Um, well, then let me challenge you. What are you afraid of? Well, with the help of my father, makes you that's flinch? not a whole lot that makes me scared anymore. But Good. we used to get calls at home yes. uh, from a racist. You mean death threats? Yes. Yeah. Racist would call our telephone and uh, say, we're going to kill your nigger father. They'd talk to Daphne on the phone and say, you nigger bitch, we're going to kill your dad. Mm. Just, just horrible stuff. And my dad would say, just ignore those people and keep on stepping, man. Yes. So um, yeah. he was fearless. Yes, he was. Justice for all. It reads like a menu. That's how quickly it reads. It hits with the power of a Buick. You put it down and it provokes thought. This man is a cultural treasure. He's an American icon. The gentleman's name is Lloyd Barbie, attorney at law, legislator, assemblyman, civil rights activist, women's rights activist. He was a man. I want to thank you for joining Think Tech today. Please join us again. I want to thank Russ Barbie, Daphne Barbie. Thank you so much, Thank folks. you for having us and being real. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Russ. Bill. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Sir.